It's a tremendous honor to be invited here to Dubai uh, by the Prime Minister's office to participate uh, in this amazing session. Uh, I cannot believe the size and the variety and the quality uh, of the participants here. Uh, I must say, uh, you know, I teach at Stanford University uh, right in the middle of Silicon Valley. And uh, a lot of the people that I've met at this session and that have been speaking to you are very familiar because uh, they're talking about the horizons that are created by new technology. Uh, and I think that that is, um, uh, it's, it's terrific that uh, the Emirates has grabbed onto this issue and is running with it uh, like very few other governments in the world. So I congratulate you on that. I, however, <laughs> I'm a political scientist, and in my current role, I have been very conscious of the fact that technology has to take place in the context of societies with established institutions. Part of the reason I think that the Emirates can move ahead as quickly uh, as it has is because it's not an old political system. There's not a lot of established political actors. But in other parts of the world, that's not the case. You're contending with a lot of entrenched uh, parties that really don't want to change. And that's particularly true in the case of global governance, which is my subject today. So let me just begin with a overview uh, of the macro situation with regard to governance. Now, this is not a new observation, but the demands for global governance are tremendous in the world today as globalization has proceeded. Uh, they come in uh, economic, security, and social baskets. The economic one is the most obvious. Trade and investment needs rules if people are to move uh, goods, investment, ideas uh, across uh, international borders. Uh, in the Middle East, the security um, issue has been dominant for uh, some time. Counterterrorism, regional rivalries, uh, that exist in this uh, area. In Latin America, there's an extraordinarily high level of violence that's really driven by the narcotics trade. And so all of these are very live issues that require international cooperation. Finally, you have social issues that have to do with diseases, uh, refugees, uh, and a lot of these issues are related to each other. And so the persistence of certain uh, infectious diseases is due to conflict, is due to the fact that health organizations cannot get into certain areas uh, that propagate uh, 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 viruses and uh, uh, the like. Now, there are other issues which have received a lot of attention already at this conference that cut across all of these areas. Climate change is obviously one of them that has economic security and political dimensions. And there's a lot of evidence that a lot of recent conflicts have been driven by climate change, by the fact that uh, the weather uh, is, uh, uh, is shifting. For example, the recent unrest in Iran. Iran is going through a major ecological and environmental crisis. The drought that it's experienced recently has been accelerating. They've been pumping groundwater, so the aquifers are dropping uh, and there's considerable evidence that part of the unrest that we've seen over the past uh, few months in that country has these uh, environmental uh, uh, causes. But that's not the only region of the world uh, in which all of this has come together. The um, supply of global governance comes in the form of these big institutions, the liberal international Order. This was an order that was put together uh, a long time ago, and it's got economic and political components. The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade that evolved into the World Trade Organization, regional agreements like the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement and uh, the European Union, and then political components that have to do with security. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the bilateral arrangements that the United States has with Japan, South Korea, other countries, more informal ones, like the defense cooperation between the United States and the countries of the Persian Gulf. Now, I want you to look at this list. <laughs> These are very old institutions. Most of them were originally put in place in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, meaning that they're 70 years old. And the big problem 
in global governance is that the underlying social reality has been moving ahead at a very rapid pace and the institutions are struggling to keep up. And in fact, the embeddedness of those institutions in the existing political order means that they are extremely difficult to change. And I think that that is at the, at the root uh, of our global governance uh, problems at the moment. Now, there has been more um, adjustment in that system than you might think from that previous list because we are living in what I call a multi multilateral world, that is to say, we have a lot of international uh, agreements. We have a lot of organizations that are usually specialized in a particular sector for a particular reason, dealing with a subset of global problems. So for example, uh, standard setting, airline safety, sanitary, phytosanitary rules that promote international trade, rules on intellectual property, all of these have specialized organizations that are in fact more flexible uh, than their large counterparts like the WTO. Uh, and I think that the presence of multiple organizations is actually a good thing. Some of them duplicate uh, the roles of others, but I think having choice is an important feature uh, that makes the system a little bit more adaptable. So for example, when the Security Council, the UN Security Council would not approve action uh, in Kosovo back in the 1990s, uh, NATO was able to take the initiative uh, and the action was moved out of the Security Council and into NATO. A lot of people didn't like that because they think that only the United Nations can authorize the use of force. I actually think it was a good thing because it provides uh, security where the, the dominant global institutions are a little bit too rigid. Now, big question that people have is whether we're actually gonna get to real global governance uh, if that means governance by a single organization like the United Nations, uh, I would say the answer is not in my lifetime. Now, I'm kind of an old guy, so that maybe may not mean that much, uh, but I would say that you know, for the next generation at least, uh, it's going to be uh, a tremendous challenge. In order to have truly global institutions, you have to have consensus among the big players in the system and the problem with a lot of these large institutions is that they don't scale well. Uh, you can't blow them up to a global scale because there is no such thing ultimately as a set of shared values, aims, even agreement on procedures among uh, the important players uh, in the system. You take the issue of UN Security Council reform, the five existing permanent uh, members of the Security Council, I think every single one of them would agree that that choice of five countries isn't particularly legitimate. The world has changed since 1947. There's a lot of new players in the world and so it obviously needs reform. The problem is that nobody can agree on what replaces that permanent five. Uh, you don't know which regions to include and even within a particular region like Latin America uh, or Sub-Saharan Africa, countries in that region cannot decide on which country ought to represent them, what powers they have, should they be uh, veto-bearing, uh, and so forth. And so there's been no progress in this area uh, at all. Within the European Union, you have very similar problems. You have a consensus required of 28 uh, member states. Uh, if you recall, uh, in the last uh, year or so, there was a blockage of the EU-Canada free trade agreement not by one of those 28 member states, but by one province in one member state, right? This is not an organization that's designed for fast, uh, efficient uh, action. And actually, if you look historically, how did things like nation states, you know, large political units arise? The unfortunate, tragic, uh, I think, lesson of human history is that almost none of them came about by consensus almost all of them required some degree of violence, you know, in the formation of modern Germany or Italy or any number of other uh, societies. Hopefully that's not going to be the pattern for international cooperation, but that means that I think that we are, um, we are, are stuck with a multi multilateral world for the time uh, being. And again, normatively, I'm not sure that that's such a terrible outcome because I don't think a single organization can represent the true diversity 
of the existing uh, global system. It's going to reflect the interests of the, of the powerful. Uh, and it's also uh, a big normative challenge because we do not know how to hold such a large global organization truly accountable to the peoples that, that uh, it seeks to represent. So we're left with multi-multilateralism. Uh, and actually, it's, a, it's an interesting world because governments are actually not the only providers of global governance. In fact, if you look around the world, you've got a layer of non-governmental organizations that pervade the international system. And so if you look at things like peacekeeping, the delivery of uh, basic humanitarian services, there's a lot of global players that are not governments that provide government-like services, and they are also an integral part of that system. They are not uh, going to go away anytime in the future. So uh, it's my sad duty to go over a number of the emerging challenges that uh, exist to this system. Uh, I'm going to spend the most time on emerging technologies and then changes in the global balance of power. I'm going to conclude by talking about some other issues that have come up just in the past couple of years, the rise of populism and then uh, migration as an international issue. But let's begin with the technological challenges. So this is what we've been talking about uh, over the past day. Uh, you are perfectly aware of the tremendous opportunities represented by um, the internet, by artificial intelligence, uh, the general IT revolution. Uh, it's interesting because the attitudes towards this have been uh, shifting. It was seen as a necessary component to globalization. You could not participate in the global economy if you were not connected to the internet and if you didn't observe the internet's rather freewheeling uh, rules. I think what we've seen in the past uh, few years is the rise of a much more sinister face in terms of cyber warfare, cyber attacks, and then the whole issue of fake news, conspiracy theories, filter bubbles, uh, and the like. There's another problem for global governance, which has to do with the fact that the five big uh, technology companies in the world, you know, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, uh, Apple, and Amazon, are all American companies. They are providing basic utilities, basic services for everybody in the world, but they are territorially based, and they reflect the interests of one of the big players in that system, and that in itself, I think, is problematic. The other area that I'm going to go into in a little bit more depth is biotechnology, because again, while that holds tremendous promise for human uh, health and well-being, uh, it also has a dark side. Cyber warfare is different from normal warfare. If you build an aircraft carrier or a nuclear weapon, all of your neighbors know that you've got it, all right? You can't hide things like that. That's not the case in cyber. We don't know really who is responsible for particular cyber attacks. A lot of cyber weapons can only be used once, like the Stuxnet virus that was used against Iran. Once you use it, you lose it, and you gotta go on to something uh, else. Many of the um, players in this area are not great powers. So for example, uh, there's evidence that Russia interfered in the Catalan uh, uh, referendum uh, that was held recently in Spain with the help of Venezuela. Venezuela is a failing state. They can't provide toilet paper, food, basic medicines to their own people, and yet they can play internationally. Uh, I think you've seen here in uh, the Middle East with the rise of ISIS and its, uh, with Daesh and its command of these kinds of technologies, uh, the emergence of a virtual terrorist uh, organization. Uh, I think we are very, very far from creating rules of the road. You've got to start with the big players, the US, Russia, and China, but they don't even agree that there's a common problem, and that uh, is uh, one of the big challenges that lies ahead. And I think that that's actually going to have to await a shift in their mutual relations before we get any progress in that area. Uh, the social media uh, has seen a 180 degree turn in uh, people's attitudes towards it as a result of its weaponization. 
in the 1990s when the internet first started, people believed that this was going to be a great tool for mass mobilization, for democracy, for citizen participation. And in many respects, that was true. Uh, it does permit this kind of organization and has been important in, in mobilizing uh, marginalized social groups. On the other hand, we've seen the use of social media uh, by certain players, both domestic and international, in, in the form of fake news. And here, there's a difference. Now, people will say propaganda uh, has always existed. Uh, you know, Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation couldn't have happened without Gutenberg's invention of the printing press. All of that is true. But things that used to take months and years to propagate through the traditional media system today can be propagated within seconds. And you have internet platforms that are, whose business model is built around virality and therefore the projection uh, of these things very uh, rapidly. Uh, we are just now contending with possible solutions. The Europeans want to regulate this, so the German uh, uh, parliament last summer passed a so-called Facebook law in which they imposed very stiff criminal penalties on fake news fines up to 50 million uh, euros. I happen to think that this is not a good solution because it's going to have a very dampening effect on free speech. Uh, I think, you know, I live uh, not that far from Google and Facebook, uh, and I think a lot of those companies themselves have a responsibility uh, to curate the kind of information that appears uh, on their platforms. They don't want to take the role of traditional media companies, but that is what they are. They are global utilities right now, but they're completely unregulated, and I don't think that that situation is one that is going to uh, last. And in fact, the politics of this, uh, I think, has been changing in the United States uh, fairly rapidly. If we move on to biotechnology, uh, in a, so I'm not going to talk about nuclear proliferation. That's kind of an old issue. It's still with us in, in North Korea and other places. It's still uh, in, in Iran. It's very dangerous, but it's also a fairly familiar problem. Uh, we are lucky in a certain sense that uh, it takes a really big industrial effort to build a nuclear weapon uh, to the point that really only nation states can attempt to do this sort of thing. Uh, on the other hand, biotech is very different. The scale is enormously smaller, especially with the rise of synthetic biology over the past decade. Today, in the United States, in Europe, in other places, you have high school students that hold competitions in synthetic bio biology uh, to synthesize organic compounds and, and uh, organisms that have not uh, existed before. Much harder to uh, monitor this sort of thing. It's been dangerous experimentation. Uh, there was one uh, lab that took uh, an H5N1 virus, which is very virulent, much more so than the, the influenza virus of 1918-19. Uh, we are lucky that that virus cannot be uh, transmitted uh, through the respiratory system over the air, but they actually synthesized a form of this that could be, uh, which they justified in terms of wanting to deal with that threat, but the experimentation itself provides a threat. There's been this convergence of the internet and, and biology. So you've had the syn synthesis of entire organisms, not from viral precursors, but simply from DNA information downloaded off of the internet. And so to transmit something extremely dangerous, it can be done uh, simply uh, electronically. This is something, again, uh, that's very new. This is simply a picture of a um, synthetic biology lab that fits inside a shipping container. You cannot put a nuclear uh, 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 centrifuge or a system of centrifuges in a shipping container. You can do this with, uh, with bioweapons. So I think the potential solutions are inevitably going to have to be more normative and regulatory because there's just too much of this stuff uh, out there. You've got to start at a national level, which we haven't done even before you get to the international level. And then you've got this just this problem of large numbers with you know, thousands of labs around the world. Even if 99.9 .9 of them adhere to certain common safety rules, that 0.1%, uh, that by itself uh, can do a lot of damage. And so I'm not sure that we have an adequate solution to that problem. Global balance of power is changing. Uh, 
The United States was critical in the formation of that liberal international order, and now the United States is being displaced. In PPP terms, some people argue that China already has a larger economy than the United States. Uh, the internet was seen as a way of democratizing and opening up China. Uh, now with their social scoring system, they've shown that they can control the internet and actually use it uh, as a means of cementing uh, their uh, authoritarian uh, power. In the meantime, both the United States and Europe have suffered major financial crises. Their political systems do not look uh, nearly as impressive as they did uh, back in the 1990s. Uh, and therefore, there's been a shift in global perceptions about the relative uh, effectiveness of these different uh, political systems. There's been talk about this so-called Thucydides trap uh, in which a rising power is highly destabilizing to the international order. Now, I don't want you to think that I am implying that China is particularly aggressive or that it's been pursuing uh, clearly expansionist aims. I think they've actually been fairly moderate in a lot of what they've done. The problem with the Thucydides trap is it doesn't depend really on intentions. It really depends on the relative balance of power. Uh, when one country gets power, uh, it's much more likely to misuse it than if it is constrained by other players in the system. The United States in the period between 1989 and 2008 when it was the dominant power, in my view, misused that power in uh, a variety of ways. And now you see since 2008, China in a sense taking over that role in areas like uh, the South China Sea. Uh, I think that uh, Korea, I mean, we can get into this in the discussion, but I actually think that the uh, financial markets are way underestimating the risk of actual military conflict. And this is a good example of the problem, that the United States and China have no interest in going to war whatsoever. However, if North Korea collapses, uh, you could imagine very easily a scenario in which the United States and South Korea move north and China moves south in a replay of what happened in 1950 during the first Korean War. And voila, you have great power conflict emerging uh, in this uh, decade. What will a world built around China rather than the United States look like? Well, we've had some hints of this with the rise of certain uh, institutions that are being promoted by China, the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Shanghai Cooperation Council. This uh, Belt and Road Initiative of Xi Jinping is mind-bogglingly ambitious. The existing global economy is transatlantic and transpacific between Europe, Asia, and uh, the United States. The Chinese want to shift the entire center of gravity uh, into the center of Eurasia and make it the hub, move a lot of manufacturing and demand out of China, not so that they can get commodities to keep doing what they've been doing for the last 30 years, but really to move on to a new stage of their own uh, national uh, development. If you look at flows of development uh, uh, lending, uh, this is the situation that existed in 2003 when China, the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank constituted about a quarter uh, of all uh, investment flows compared to the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. This is what it looked like uh, in 2009. So now China, the Chinese banks constituted about 60% of the total. And in 2016, it looked like this. These Chinese banks constitute three quarters uh, of all of the uh, aid flows, or not, these are not aid flows, this is investment, uh, coming uh, uh, to developing countries uh, around the world. And so China is really displacing the United States in many uh, respects. How they deal with things like global infrastructure standards will be an important test uh, of how they uh, adjust to the um, uh, system. I think the early indicators are good because I do think that they want to raise their standards and play in a multilateral fashion. Uh, now, this is the final slide. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about this except to say that in my view, one of the biggest threats to the global liberal order is actually coming from within democratic countries in both Europe and in the United States.
uh, right now. There's been a populist backlash against globalization. Uh, not everybody benefits from free trade, so former working classes in the developed world, in the rich world, have been losing uh, employment. Migration is an important identity issue. It's at levels that are unprecedented in recent uh, history, and people want to protect their national cultures and their national uh, identities. And so when the leading countries that built this international order start turning against it, uh, I think we are in a position uh, of some peril. So I'm sorry to, <laughs> if this has seemed like a somewhat pessimistic view, I think that in the end, uh, these institutions, the international institutions, are actually uh, more durable than we give them credit for. Uh, but uh, I look forward to uh, the conversation with His Excellency Mr. Gargash, the uh, uh, Secretary of State for Foreign uh, Affairs, uh, and uh, to a deeper discussion of all of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to have this uh, discussion with uh, Dr. Fukuyama, uh, who has uh, been thought-provoking in many of his uh, writings and, uh, and quite an influencer, really, over a lot of the discussions that have taken place, uh, especially, I would say, since uh, the change that we have seen in the international order. My, my first question, actually, is looking at things from a Middle Eastern perspective. And uh, you've worked a lot on governance and institutions. Uh, do, can we actually establish uh, a credible economic and political model without a liberal DNA? Can we actually create governance, institutions, and the, the presence of strong governance and institutions without really having the essential uh, Western model of a liberal DNA as a backbone, can that work? Well, I think that actually the Gulf has proved that it can uh, in, in many respects. So it, it really depends on what you mean by liberal DNA. I actually think that the Gulf gets the liberal part well. I mean, you have something that looks like a credible rule of law, property rights, you know, the ability to adjudicate commercial disputes, all of that stuff. That's the liberal part. You don't have the democratic accountability in the form of elections, but I think that you know, what we've seen in many countries around the world is that part of it is really not critical for um, economic prosperity. Uh, and I think you know, the Gulf, in many respects, has shown the rest of the Arab world uh, what's possible if you have that component of governance down, if you have a stable state that has the competence to actually deliver services. Uh, if you have a rule of law, then you can get uh, economic growth. I think the big tragedy in the Arab world is that getting to a stable state, uh, I'm not, and I'm not talking about a, a democratic one necessarily, but just getting to a state uh, has been the big downfall of Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya, uh, Yemen. I mean, all of these countries are basically, you know, have experienced some form of state failure. Uh, and, you know, a state is not just about having visible institutions, it's a question of legitimacy. And having a legitimate state, you know, has been a big challenge, and so that's really the institutional issue that I think needs to be solved in this region. Okay. I, I also want to use the time to try and address several things that are on my mind. Uh, you've always thought uh, of the invasion of Iraq as a, a precursor to U.S. Uh, the American declining role in the region. Yes. At the same time, uh, there is a fluidity in the international system. If looking forward, looking a decade forward, we have really moved from a bipolar world. We're seeing really America as a reluctant player in many regions. What sort of uh, international system we're moving on uh, in the next decade, if, if you had to predict? Well, look, we're clearly moving towards a multilateral or, or, or a multipolar world. I think that the dominance and the hegemony of the United States for this 20-year period between the fall of the Berlin Wall and the financial crisis on Wall Street in the 2000s was, a, it was an anomaly. There are very few historical periods in which one 
country uh, possessed that much military, economic, social, and cultural power. And so we're, we're, we're reverting to the mean. We're reverting to a more normal world in which there are alternative sources of power. And in many respects, that's a good thing. Uh, the problem is that the adjustment is very difficult, especially for Americans, because Americans are used to being in charge and being able to call the shots. I think that Obama represented you know, the, the disengagement and the reaction to the um, perceived failures in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. And so you're getting this very difficult multipolar world. And Syria is kind of the, you know, the chief <laughs> example of, of why that's not a good situation either. So I do think that there needs to be uh, some kind of regional structure that involves these great powers that establishes limits to what they are uh, willing to do. You know, we're moving towards the possibility of, you know, much more serious clashes between Israel, the United States, Russia, uh, and Iran uh, in Syria. And if that's not going to get out of hand, uh, you, you know, you really need that kind of a, a international structure. Ideology was an important part in the previous bipolar world that we lived in. Uh, how important is ideology going to be in this sort of fluid, multi-centric world? Well, this is an issue that uh, I'm writing about quite a lot because I think that old 20th century ideological world where you had poles established between free market capitalism and communism uh, is dead. Uh, and it's giving way to a world that's based on identity. Uh, and there are many identities in the world. Uh, it's very problematic in the following sense that identity is one of those things that you can't really compromise on. Uh, you, you have a kind of zero-sum struggle between people that define their identity in, in ethnic or racial or religious terms. Uh, and that's one of the things that's driving conflict in, in, in this region. Uh, and so I think we need to actually get back to a focus on things other than identity if, if you're going to get people to accept political structures that take account of the de facto diversity of our world today. And of course, issues of identity are at the heart also of what's going on in our region. Absolutely. And very problematic. Uh, you've, you've spoken about uh, the rise of strongmen, whether these people are Donald Trump or whether they are uh, Vladimir Putin or people even like uh, Orban in, in Hungary. Uh, you look at it as a sort of a challenge for mm -hmm. the system from within. But the question is, how important is leadership in really uh, addressing the challenges in the world? I mean, mm -hmm. we're looking at strong men from a negative perspective. But at the same time, I think we have to also address the other side of it. How important is leadership really in issues of economic and political regeneration? It's, it's hugely uh, important. So I think one of the things that you've just identified is the fact that many democracies in the world have had a lot of trouble making hard decisions. Uh, the United States, you know, first and foremost. The U.S. Congress has not passed a budget under regular order for the last 20 years. We just had a government shutdown you know, because of that failure. And so that creates a demand for the strong man that's going to cut through all of the nonsense of, of normal democratic politics. And that's very dangerous because a real democracy is not based on individuals. It's based on institutions. And every single one of the, you know, so there's a, a long list of them. There's Orban, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, the uh, Kaczynski in Poland. I would put my president uh, in this category. All of these leaders say, I'm the one that's going to solve the problem. Now, under the right leadership, you know, like a Lincoln or a Churchill or a Franklin Roosevelt, that can lead to wonderful things. It can lead to a strengthening of institutions. But every single one of these other individuals, I think, has been responsible for weakening and undermining uh, the existing institutions in their societies. And then the problem is what happens when they depart the scene. I mean, they can do a lot of damage by themselves, but it's not a, a sustainable uh, political outcome. And that's, I think, the danger that a lot of countries face uh, at the present. Okay. Uh, again, using the time that we have, uh, 
you've, you've been looking at Tunisia and you've been looking at Iran, two totally different uh, examples of political and economic development. Where do you see the main challenges facing uh, Tunisia and where do you see the main challenge facing Iran? So Tunisia, I've been to a couple of times just in the past few months. I think that it's the only country that actually could be called a real democracy coming out of the Arab Spring. Uh, but they have got this problem of many new democracies. They are not delivering on economic growth. Uh, rates of especially youth unemployment are extremely high. Their labor market is way too rigid. And none of the political players seems to have a good idea of what kind of reforms are necessary to get them out of that. And I think that's why, I mean, they're not about to collapse, but I think that they're hanging on uh, by a thread. Iran is a very different story because in my perception, there's been a social revolution that's been going on under the surface in that country. It's one of the best educated countries uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it's always had relatively sophisticated institutions. I believe something like 60% of the many college graduates uh, uh, in that country are female uh, right now. And it just doesn't correspond to the existing political institutions that are held by you know, a very conservative rural uh, uh, power base. And so I would think that that's a country that's headed towards you know, some kind of an explosion uh, down the road. Uh, it's very hard to predict what that's going to look like, but, uh, but you know, I'm afraid that it's, it's not a stable uh, situation. Okay. Again, uh, trying to give a more Middle East angle to our uh, discussion, you've always thought that political Islam is an integral part of uh, developments in the region. Uh, as a political scientist, how do you see uh, that developing in the next decade? Uh, that uh, is very hard to say because it depends on all of these other external players and so it's not going to be allowed to play out by itself. I think political Islam, even in its more moderate versions like the, the Muslim Brotherhood or, or uh, Inada in, in Tunisia, uh, have certain you know, difficulties in reconciling with a fully liberal uh, political order. But the more radical versions of it, I think, appeal to the identity problems that are created by rapid modernization. Uh, this is something I've felt for a long time. It, it's very much like 19th century European modernization. In this region, you have a lot of people that lived in villages that uh, practice a very traditional form of Islam. They move to a city. They have uh, satellite TV, the internet, or they move to Europe. Uh, it's very, very disorienting in terms of who they are. And I think that one of the things that the radical Islamists can do is offer them identity, community, commitment, uh, you know, something to live for. And that's why the stories, the individual stories of a lot of people that become jihadists or terrorists is, is actually very uh, similar. They're, they're people that are actually looking for an identity and they find it uh, in this particular form interpretation. Uh, of Islam, and that obviously is, you know, is a very dangerous thing. Yeah. There's a tendency now to reread your seminal work, <laughs> okay? Uh, the End of History and the Last Man. Uh, some thoughts on that? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that, because uh, actually if you go back to that original book, I talked about this kind of issue. I talked about the fact that human beings are driven by a struggle for recognition. Everybody, every one of us feels we have a certain inner dignity and we get very angry and resentful when other people don't recognize that dignity. Now, democracy is based on that. I mean, the, the belief that we are all equal political agents that have rights and a, and a share in power. But it turns out that living in a democracy sometimes isn't enough. We all also want to be recognized as members of groups of a certain racial group or an ethnicity or a religion uh, or, you know, other things. I mean, gender, you know, uh, there, there are many other conditions that uh, people look to to define their identity in the modern world. Uh, and that, I think, is the Achilles heel of many democracies, that uh, people don't feel that uh, their political system gives them the opportunities to really define themselves uh, and doesn't give them the kind of recognition that they want. Uh, 
And that propels, I think, the sort of identity politics you see in the heart of tolerant, liberal, multicultural societies today. Yeah. You spoke about China. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, again, from our perspective in the region, we see perhaps a more activist China, but not necessarily too activist yet in, uh, in where we are from our uh, perspective. Uh, is China going to be more of an important sub-global power in its region, or is it actually looking for a bigger role? I, mean, I think it's a global power already. Okay. Uh, that's what I was trying to say about this shifting balance of power. It is going to be a global power, and it may be the most powerful global power in a few years. Uh, and everybody is going to have to adjust to that. So increasingly, the world will be governed according to rules that are made in Beijing rather than Washington or London uh, or other places. And that is going to be a very hard uh, adjustment for a lot of people uh, to make. So far, I would say the early signs are not that terrible because they do want to be multilateral. They do want to show that they're responsible as a global power, but, but that's really a huge challenge. Yeah. Dr. Fukuyama, thank you very much. Thank you.